Hello YouTube. Uh, today we're going to return to the Scientific Realism series uh, and I'd like to uh, explore a recent addition to the realism debate known as uh, Scientific Perspectivism which has been uh, developed by Ronald Gieri. Uh, Gieri's basic motivation uh, is to find a, a kind of middle position between objectivist realism on the one hand and uh, anti-realism or relativism on the other. Um, if you've watched the rest of this series, something you'll probably have noticed is that when we think about scientific knowledge, there are two competing intuitions. So on the one hand, science seems to involve discovery, where we learn things about the external world. Uh, and it's this discovery, uh, it's this ability for discovery that supports the remarkable technological and predictive success of the sciences. And this kind of intuition pushes us towards realism. On the other hand, science is a human activity. Scientific theories are always proposed in particular social or historical contexts, and of course this will lead to limitations of scientific knowledge. This pushes us towards uh, anti-realism. So perspectivism tries to find a middle path, it tries to respect both of these intuitions. Um, now Gieri is definitely more on the realist side, but he sees perspectivism as providing a more limited form of realism. Um, which kind of takes into account the human context of scientific activity uh, and, and, and the limitations that this imposes on, on scientific knowledge. So Gieri uh, begins with a discussion of colour vision uh, and the idea is that we can treat scientific observation and scientific theories as being analogous to colour vision. So we'll uh, explore colour in a, a bit of detail. I, I have a, an, a currently unfinished series on philosophy of colour, and if you want more detail on the science of colour vision, uh, go and watch the first video on that, because I, I, I go into, uh, I explain a bit of the science of colour vision in, in that video. Uh, so an important principle of modern colour science is trichromatic theory, which states that all of the colours we can see uh, can be produced by combinations of just three monochromatic lights. So if you have a, a red light, a blue light and a green light, by putting those lights in different combinations you can create the full range of colours that humans can see. And this is what many uh, TVs and computer screens use. Uh, you know, the, the pixels will be, uh, each pixel will be one of these three colours. And so by combining the colours they can produce all of the colours that we see. Now this is, this is because the cones in the human retina each contain one of three different types of photopigment which are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. These are the uh, short, medium and long wavelength cones. This graph shows um, the sensitivities of the cones. Um, so you've got the short wavelength in blue, the medium wavelength in green and the long wavelength in red. Um, the black line shows the sensitivities of the uh, rods in the retina, but those aren't involved in colour vision, so you don't need to worry about that. The crucial point to, to see here is that each individual cone is colour blind. Right? So let's take the L cone, shown in red. Um, if, you, if you look at sort of light of about, say, 650 nanometers, you'll see that that will produce exactly the same response as light of about 490 nanometers. Okay, e each 490 nanometer light and 650 nanometer light activate the cone to the same extent. Um, so you know, you'll get the same response in the cone with each type of light. So it's not going to be able to distinguish between those two different wavelengths. But now if you add a cone of different sensitivity, so let's say we add the, uh, the, the medium wavelength cone, well, a given light will excite the cones differently. The 490 nanometer light will excite the M cones much more than the L cones. The 650 nanometer light barely activates the M cones at all. Uh, so now we can distinguish the wavelengths and this gives us color perception. Uh, so color perception arises from processing the differences in the activation of the cones. Now humans have three types of cones, but many organisms uh, as a, uh, have a, a different system. Uh, most other mammals are dichromatic, so they have only two types of photopigments, which renders them effectively red-green colorblind. Uh, this uh, little picture shows the difference between 
the human visual spectrum and the visual spectrum that a dog perceives. You can see that the dog's visual spectrum is fairly impoverished relative to the human's. Now there's kind of an interesting evolutionary story here. Um, you, know, you might say, well, wh why are humans lucky, right? Why did our uh, ancestors develop red-green discrimination? Now, we don't know exactly, but one interesting proposal is our ancestors were tree dwellers and they needed to distinguish ripe fruit from the trees because ripe fruit provides um, you know, much better nutrition. Now, in dichromatic vision, everything in a forest looks pretty much the same. So here's how a foresty sort of scene would look to a dog. And, you know, you can see you can't really distinguish anything. It just, you know, it's just all green. Uh, uh, now, if you add red-green discrimination, well, suddenly certain things pop out at you and it's, it's much easier to navigate and you can see the ripe fruit. So uh, that is one possible reason why we uh, have developed much better vision than most other mammals. Uh, furthermore, there are animals with superior colour discrimination to humans. Hawks and eagles are tetrachromats. They have four photopigments with one in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And there's evidence that some pigeons are pentachromats with five photopigments. So there are a lot of different uh, visual systems out there. Now, we say that grass is green, but it seems that greenness doesn't inhere in the grass. Uh, you know, it's not an objective property of the grass, independent of any observations. On the other hand, it seems like it's not wholly subjective either. Colour perception does give us reliable information about the world. So it seems that what's really going on is that uh, these colour properties arise through an interaction between properties of the grass and the structure of the human visual system. So we can make some general points about colour perspectives. First, there are no colours independently of a perspective. Our visual system provides a particular coloured perspective on the world. Colours only exist within that perspective. They only exist given the interaction between the visual system and the world. If you, if you take out either, either element, then you don't have any colours. Secondly, uh, claims made within a perspective can be true or false. It's true that grass is green and that the sky is blue, at least you know, for, for a normal human with a trichromatic visual system. Um, you know, if, a, if a normal human was to claim that sky is yellow, that the sky is the same colour as a banana, well, that would just be false. Um, that just isn't the uh, view of the world that our visual perspective provides. So colour perception tracks genuine constancies uh, in the human environment. However, uh, different perspectives are not necessarily incorrect. Where a trichromat such as a human sees a pattern of red and green, a dichromat like a dog might just see a uniform blue. Uh, but we wouldn't say that the dog's perspective is wrong, it just has a different perceptual system. Uh, different perspectives are simply different, they're not, not necessarily conflicting. Uh, still, um, different perspectives can be better or worse given your purposes. The trichromat extracts more information from the world, or at least the trichromat is able to make distinctions that dichromats can't. Uh, as we saw, the trichromat can distinguish between the ripe and the unripe fruit. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that uh, simply adding more types of visual uh, receptors isn't necessarily going to be good. Right. So if a creature had 20 types of photoreceptors, that might be far too complex to process the information in any useful way. So you know, there's, there's, it would be wrong to think that you know, merely by adding uh, more types of photopigment, more types of photoreceptors, you get a, an increasingly accurate view of the world. Um, it, it depends on what your purposes are and you know, it depends on the context. Finally, colour perspectives are partial. The visual system responds to only a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Different visual systems will be able to make different discriminations. So Gieri thinks that this uh, gives us a view of colour which is neither straightforwardly realist nor anti-realist. Um, colour perception gives us reliable knowledge of the world, but this knowledge is perspectival and there's no single perspective that is uniquely privileged. There are just many different colour perspectives.
Now, I should note that Gary's analysis of colour is actually uh, pretty contentious. Um, there's been a lot of work on philosophy of colour, and this kind of interactionist position that Gary presents is just one of many. Um, so uh, again, you can see my videos on philosophy of colour for a, for more detail there. As I say, the, the series isn't hasn't been finished yet, but you'll you'll see that there are um, quite a few other approaches to uh, philosophy of colour. So maybe uh, this wasn't the best choice for an analogy, but um, I mean I think we can see the idea. I think we can see how this uh, perspectivism idea is supposed to work in the case of colour. Anyway, uh, Gieri tries to extend the same approach to uh, all kinds of perception and observation and even to theorising. So let's take observation. In almost all areas of science, we now use sophisticated instruments to extend our capacities for observation. But this doesn't allow us to overcome the limitations of perspective, because all scientific instruments are perspectival in exactly the same way as colour vision. Uh, indeed, colour vision can be seen as uh, sort of just one kind of instrument for extracting information from, from the world. So uh, there's a pretty tight analogy here between uh, the human visual system and, and other types of scientific instruments. So instruments are perspectival in two ways. First of all, they are they're partial. Uh, they respond only to particular types of input. Second, the output of an instrument is determined by the input plus the instrument's internal structure. So we might naively think of instruments as being mere windows onto the world. When we look through a window, the window doesn't alter how the world appears, right? You just, you see the world as you would see it if there were, if there were no window there. And similarly, you might think that you simply point the instrument, switch it on or whatever, and this gives you uh, a picture of the world that just shows the world as it is. But, but this is wrong. The, what, what you the information that you receive from an instrument is very strongly dependent on the internal structure and processing of that instrument. Uh, Gary illustrates this with the use of imaging technologies in neuroscience, so we'll go through a few of these. One of the first brain imaging technologies was computer-assisted tomography, or CAT scanning. This is basically a form of X-ray imaging, where X-rays are shot through the head of the subject at a range of different angles uh, as shown in this diagram. Now, we know that denser material causes greater attenuation of X-rays, so no X-rays will be able to pass through bones, for example, uh, and then in, in different kinds of soft tissue, the X-rays will be attenuated at different rates. The immediate data that we get from this instrument is just a recording of the relative attenuation of the X-rays for a range of uh, lines through the subject's head. And this data is then analysed by a computer that uses it to construct uh, an image uh, showing a slice of the brain. Uh, in this image, um, the, the, the bones are white um, and you, know, you sort of get a, get a picture of the brain there. Uh, now, CAT scanning is fairly limited. Uh, it provides information only about the overall structure of the brain. It doesn't provide information about the functions of its parts. It doesn't tell us what the brain is doing. Information about function can be gained from positron emission tomography, or PET scanning. In this method, radioactive isotopes are injected into a patient's bloodstream. Uh, when the isotopes decay, they emit a positron and a neutrino. Uh, neutrinos interact very rarely with matter, so they all escape without a trace. Uh, but the positron is the antimatter counterpart to the electron, and it very quickly collides with an electron, causing both to decay into a pair of gamma rays. And these two gamma rays travel off in opposite directions. In the uh, PET machines, as shown in this diagram, the subject is surrounded by an array of gamma ray detectors that record only coincidences received at exactly opposite points. So when the gamma ray is detected at both sides nearly simultaneously, uh, we can determine which part of the brain it originated from. Uh, and so we can use this to produce a picture of the brain showing where the radioactive substance is most concentrated, and that will show us uh, the parts of the brain where blood is being delivered. So here we have a standard uh, PET scan image, which shows the difference between a healthy brain and an Alzheimer's brain. Uh, red indicates 
um, the higher blood flow. And so this tells us something about function. It tells us something about the actual processes that are going on in the, in, in the brain. Probably the most famous brain imaging technology is, is MRI. So uh, in MRI, uh, protons have a small magnetic field. And when placed in an external magnetic field, they will orient themselves either parallel or anti-parallel to it. However, they don't line up perfectly. Instead, they sort of uh, kind of process around, around an axis, kind of like um, you know, if you get a spinning top and the spinning, the spinning top will you know, kind of uh, go into a process, it will sort of rotate around, around, an axis, around an axis. Now, by applying a pulse of radio frequency radiation, uh, that is in resonance with the natural rotation frequency of the protons. The protons are forced to rotate in phase together. They, they process in phase together. And all of these small magnetic fields rotating in phase produces a detectable radio signal. Now, when the external radio frequency pulse terminates, the protons, of course, go out of phase, so they no longer produce a detectable radio signal. And the key to magnetic resonance imaging is that the rate at which the, pro the protons go out of phase is dependent on their environment. So we can, you know, you, you, you apply a, a pulse of uh, radio frequency radiation, and then that's going to make the protons rotate in phase, and that will make them produce a radio signal. And in different materials, they will go out of phase, you know, when you turn the, the external radio pulse off, the protons will go out of phase at different rates. So we can use different uh, rates of radio signal decay to distinguish between, say, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. And since we know that oxygenated blood will be found in regions of higher neuronal activity, we can use this data to learn about the function of different parts of the brain. This is just an example, uh, example image. So all of these instruments provide particular perspectives on the brain. They don't reveal the structure and processing of the, of the brain as it really is. Uh, they, you know, the, these images are obviously very much dependent on how the detectors work and on the computer programs that convert the raw data into an image. What we observe can only be properly understood with reference to the means of observation. So this is analogous to the case of colour perception. Now, an important thing to note here is that we have multiple perspectives on the brain, right? I mean, we, we, uh, w with all the different instruments we have, we're not just limited to one perspective. Uh, some perspectives are better than others with respect to certain goals. So PET scanning is preferable to CAT scanning if we want to investigate the function of different brain parts. But at no point do we ever, ha like, gain... Do we ever escape perspective? We, we never have a non-perspectival view of the brain as it really is. We just have a variety of, of, of different perspectives that, that reveal the brain in different ways. So, uh, you know, that's kind of uh, interesting. I'm not sure how controversial this, uh, this kind of discussion is. I mean, it, it, it does seem like probably most realists aren't going to disagree with Gieri um, up to this point, you know, it seems pretty pretty obvious actually uh, that yeah, of course, uh, scientific instruments have these kinds of limitations. They only provide uh, a certain perspectives on the world. But arguably, this doesn't necessarily tell as much about scientific knowledge. After all, scientists draw conclusions that go beyond what is revealed by their instruments. Uh, our theories will tell us about entities and processes that can't be detected at all. Um, so our means of observing the brain may be perspectival, but we think that we can use these perspectival observations to generate theories about how the brain really is. Uh, and, and those theories should, should not, in, in any sense, really be dependent on perspective. So the, the sort of standard realist would probably say that this perspectival nature of instrumentation is not all that significant when we turn to theorising. But Gieri argues that scientific theories are also perspectival. So how does this work? Um, I mean, there's an immediate worry here because theories aren't even the same kind of thing as instruments. 
Uh, Gieri's paradigm case of a perspective is colour vision. Uh, we have a coloured perspective on the world. Now I think it makes some sense to extend this to scientific instruments because, uh, as I mentioned, we can treat the human visual system as basically being a kind of instrument, right? It's an instrument that is responsive to certain wavelengths of light. Um, so human eyes, an fMRI machine, a telescope, an electron microscope and so on. Speaking abstractly, these are the same kinds of thing. Um, they're instruments that we use to, uh, to, to pick up certain properties in, of the world. Now, so the question is, you know, how can this notion of perspective be extended to scientific theories? Well, the basic idea is that when we engage in theorizing, scientific laws define perspectives, and from these perspectives, we generate models of the world. Newton's laws define the Newtonian perspective, and from this perspective, uh, we generate models of, for example, the Earth-Moon system. So if you take Newton's laws and add certain specific conditions, you get a specific testable model. Now, I should just say, we usually think of models as being concrete things, like you might have an actual toy of the solar system, like a clockwork toy that has the, uh, the, the planets and the sun actually moving around, you know, we, we have a physical model. Many models in science are abstractions. So to, to have, a, say, a model of the Earth-Moon system, that's to represent the Earth-Moon system in a certain way, maybe describe it with certain equations or whatever. Uh, one important type of model in science is the mathematical model, where we use equations to describe the behavior of a system. Obviously, mathematical models are abstract. You don't actually construct them. And so when I talk about models here, uh, I'm not just referring to uh, physical models or concrete models, but, but also these abstractions uh, that we use to describe things. So Gieri says that scientific laws make no claims about the world. Only models constructed from laws make such claims. Uh, laws are the templates for the construction of specific models. Uh, now, it probably seems a bit odd to say that laws make no claims about the world, um, but uh, here Gieri uh, is, I think, drawing on uh, Nancy Cartwright's uh, discussion of laws in her book, How the Laws of Physics Lie. Uh, at any rate, Gieri takes pretty much the same position as, as Cartwright, so I'll explain her view uh, just a little. Cartwright says that science provides uh, what are called Ceratus Paribus laws. Ceratus Paribus means other things being equal. Um, so if you consider the law of universal gravitation, uh, this tells us that two bodies attract each other with a force that varies inversely as the square of the distance and varies directly as the product of their masses. Um, and this is a very important law. But, if I st but when we state it plainly like this, it's, it's just false, right? It doesn't describe how objects actually behave. And this is because there are many other forces, such as electrical forces, that will affect any two bodies. So the force between them uh, will not be equal to this. Uh, in fact, very often, this won't even be approximately true. If you consider the interaction of electrons and protons within an atom, the electrical force is far more significant than gravitation. So we say that universal gravitation is a ceteris paribus law. Right? Ceteris paribus, other things being equal, two bodies exert this force on each other. Or more specifically, we should say that if there are no forces other than gravitational forces at work, then two bodies uh, exert a force on each other which equals this. Now, stated like this, the law is true, but we now have the problem that it's simply inapplicable, because in the vast majority of cases, there are other forces at work. So pretty much all actual phenomena, pretty much all of the things in the real world, will be outside the domain of application of, of, of this law, right? This qualified law just doesn't apply to anything in the real world. So we have a dilemma. If we want to treat laws as describing reality, right, then we seem to have two options, right? We can state the law without the ceteris paribus condition, 
Uh, and in, in that case, we can apply it to the stuff in the world, but then it just turns out to be false. And, then we, and it's obviously false. It's not even approximately true. On the other hand, if we take it with the ceteris paribus condition specified, then, you know, okay, the law may be true, but it's just inapplicable to anything in the real world. So that looks like a, you know, a bit of a bit of a problem, uh, especially since we usually think that that scientific laws are uh, among the greatest achievements of our sciences. Well, the solution um, that Gieri has is to say that the law itself doesn't describe reality. Instead, we use the laws to generate more specific models. We might create a model of the um, Earth Moon system by saying, well, let's treat the planets, let's pretend that the planets are simple point masses. So we will just pretend that we're dealing with just the Earth and the Moon and we'll treat them as simple point masses. So we ignore all other forces other than gravitation. Um, you know, so in, in this model, uh, the law of universal gravitation does correctly describe uh, the forces at work between the Earth and the Moon, because we're just imagining two point masses and nothing else. Well, then what we can say is that this model uh, fits the behaviour of the actual Earth and the Moon to, a, to within a certain degree of accuracy. Um, and so, you know, you can then do the, the same for, say, Jupiter and the Sun, or Jupiter and its moons, or whatever. Uh, we have a variety of models of parts of the solar system which are built from a Newtonian perspective. Um, and we can then ask how well these models fit the actual system. Uh, we can apply the same kind of analysis to biology. Um, I won't go into this in too much detail here, but I have a video on fitness and natural selection where I uh, examine an interesting discussion of fitness by Robert Brandon. The basic idea is that in evolutionary theory, we have a law along these lines. If A is fitter than B in environment E, then probably A will have more offspring than B in E. That should be uh, fairly straightforward as a basic principle of modern evolutionary theory. Now, uh, Brandon considers this to be just untestable. Uh, again, I explain his argument in the fitness and natural selection video. I, I don't have time to explain it here, so go and watch that if you're interested. But you know, assuming this law is, or this principle is untestable, um, you know, does that mean that evolutionary theory is untestable? Well, no, because we can treat this principle as defining a, a perspective from which specific testable models of populations can be generated. We, we might, uh, if we're dealing with populations of moths, say, we might have a specific model where we say, if moth A is darker winged than moth B, in some polluted forest X, then probably A will have more offspring than B in X. Um, in, in this case then, making a testable model requires specifying a particular population, sharing a common environment, and specifying which features improve survival and reproduction. E the, ev the, the general principle, the general evolutionary principles don't describe the world, the models uh, built according to these principles are what are, what are actually tested. Now, a crucial part of Gieri's view is that scientists use models by exploiting similarities between models and the world. Models represent the world in virtue of being similar to it in certain respects. So, I mean, this is probably the easiest to understand if you think about a concrete model, like Watson and Crick's model of the DNA molecule. This is made from uh, balls on bits of metal. Uh, so obviously this is very different from DNA in many ways, uh, in terms of the material constitution, in terms of its size, the relations it has to its surroundings, and so on. But what Watson and Crick were doing with this model was illustrating the general shape and structure of DNA, the uh, double helix shape and the structure of the chemical bonds. This, the model represents DNA in virtue of these similarities. And the thought is that <clears throat> The abstract models work the same way. Uh, if you know, a, a, an abstract model which takes the Earth and the Moon as being two point masses is similar to the system in certain specified respects and it represents the system 
in virtue of those similarities. Now, strictly speaking, models aren't true or false because uh, you know, truth and falsity are things that apply to statements and a model isn't a statement. But what we can say is that a, you know, a model fits a particular system and it will fit it more or less well. So what can be true or false are claims about how well and in what respects a model fits a system. Now this is, uh, of course, just how we would describe the outputs of instruments. So you know, here's a, the, the, the MRI image. It doesn't make any sense to think of this image as being true or false, right? Not literally. This is just an image, not a statement, but it represents the brain. And if we, see, and if we take this as a representation of the brain, then we can say that it fits the brain more or less well, or at least it fits certain aspects of the brain more or less well. So at the point of all this is that Ghiari would say that models and pictures work basically the same way. Uh, essentially, we can think of models as providing us with uh, pictures of the world or maps of the world. So we can see that, that the way in which theories are perspectives, according to Ghiari, both instruments and theories can be used to generate pictures of the world, and these pictures will bear certain similarities to the world. So I hope that, that, uh, that that's clear. Now let's relate this to the five points that I made about colour vision. Well, first of all, all scientific models of the world are dependent on one's perspective. Uh, second, claims made within a perspective can be true or false. It, you know, it's, it's true or false that a model is similar to the world in whatever respects. Within the evolutionary perspective, it may be true that if moth A is darker winged than moth B in polluted forest X, then A will have more offspring than B in X. So we, we can say that in this respect, the model fits the biological system. And an evolutionary biologist who claims that lighter winged moths have, will have more offspring is just wrong. Right? So we, we have truth and falsehood as a, a standard scientific realist would expect. On the other hand, different perspectives are not necessarily incorrect. Uh, I mean, this is most obvious in something like physics, where we use Newtonian mechanics and general relativity and quantum theory. Uh, we use all of these to, uh, to, to generate models that are relevantly similar to processes going on in the world, even though the laws of these theories are mutually inconsistent. That the point is that <clears throat> in all these cases, we have perspectives on the world that can be used to generate models that are relevantly similar uh, to processes going on in the world. Fourth, different perspectives can be better or worse depending on your purposes. If we are modeling the solar system, say, uh, well, general relativity will be more accurate, especially for the orbit of Mercury around the Sun. Uh, New Newtonian mechanics gives the wrong result for the precession of Mercury's perihelion, at least given the degree of accuracy required in, in modern astronomy. Uh, but general relativity uh, is much more complex, and for many purposes the Newtonian models will, will do. So it, it's going to depend on you know, what your goals are, what your purposes are, what it is you're trying to achieve. Uh, depend, depending on, on, on what, what your purposes are, that will make a difference to which perspective is better. Finally, all perspectives are partial. All perspectives have limits. A model generated from a scientific perspective will only fit some parts of the world, and the fit will always be imperfect. Now, this point is crucial because, you know, I mean, you, you might think, well, couldn't there be a perspective that provides a totally accurate and comprehensive picture of the world? And if so, that would give us just standard, straightforward scientific realism. But Gieri says that this is impossible. Uh, and there's a general argument for this point, which uh, comes from what's known as Bonini's paradox. The idea is that when constructing a model, there's always a trade-off between completeness, accuracy, and comprehension. The whole point of creating models is to allow us to understand how the world works. But the trouble is that as a model becomes more realistic, and as it captures more of the stuff going on in the world, it will become more complex and thus less understandable. A classic example of this is, imagine creating a map of a town. 
we might start off with uh, a simple line drawing showing the streets and the houses, the, the, you know, the general layout. Well, then we add information about the population. We maybe use different colors for different demographics, etc. And then let's say we decide to uh, represent the structure of the town in 3D. So we build a little model. Uh, but then we want the actual size of our model to be more realistic and, and so on. Now, if you take this to its conclusion, well, obviously, the perfect map, the ideal map, would just be a, a molecule for molecule identical reconstruction of the town. But then that's going to be useless as a map, right? Because it's just going to be the town itself. We have the same problem with scientific models. Um, as, as, as you make a model more and more and more accurate and more and more complete, uh, its, its utility as a model is going to reach some limits. You, know, you, might, you might as well just take the world itself. So there can never be a perfect model or a set of perfect models. This limited partial perspectival realism is the best that can be achieved. Now, of course, you, know, you might respond, well, OK, you can't have a perfect model of the world as a whole, but couldn't there still be a model that perfectly captures particular aspects of the world? So, you know, we couldn't we make a perfect model of, say, um, you know, the gravitational uh, relations in the Earth Moon system, something very specific like that. I mean, after all, a map, we might think, could perfectly represent the spatial relations um, between certain things. Um, so couldn't a model work the same way? Well, Gary says that, no, this can't be done. Uh, again, there's a general argument here. Uh, Gary says, take a model that is not complete. So take a model that, model that leaves out some aspects of the world. Well, the things that are not represented in that model must have causal, causal connections to the things it does represent. And so the model does not accurately represent certain interactions. It, it doesn't accurately represent those interactions between the represented things and the unrepresented things, which means that only a complete model of the world could be uh, perfectly accurate. And as we saw, that's something that can never be achieved. So that means that scientists are never going to achieve a uh, final theory, a theory of everything that is uh, sort of perfect in any way. There will always be these multiple incompatible perspectives. Uh, and Gary thinks that this um, represents a, a sort of concession to, to the anti-realist. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not so sure that, that anything Gary has said here is actually going to be at all troubling to a standard scientific realist. It seems to me that you know, he sort of sometimes presents it as being a kind of compromise position, but um, but I, I do. I mean, it certainly seems to be more on the realist side. Uh, still, you know, it's uh, an interesting way of looking at things, um, and that's all I will talk about today. So thanks for watching. Goodbye.